Um, I'd like to call the school committee meeting to order December 18th, 2017. And we're beginning just a little bit after the hour. We have a, just a slight change in the order of the agenda. Our uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Robinson, will join us at approximately 7.30. So we're going to, um, we will do our uh, public comment and then we're going to um, hold off on the interview and vote to appoint new school committee member until approximately 7.30. We're going to start doing the budget overview mm -hmm. immediately after the public input. Um, then we will sort of return back to our agenda items. Um, so right now I'd like to see if there's anyone who's here to offer public comment on any item that is not on the agenda. Hi. Chief Sagala, thank you. Good evening. I'm here uh, due to a statement I made on Wednesday night at the Board of Selectmen meeting, so I just want to clarify my statement that I made the other night at the Board of Selectmen. Uh, in my remarks on Wednesday, I was speaking generally about the experiences of law enforcement since the passage of marijuana ballot measure last year. In my remarks, I said we deal with marijuana with kids now in the high school on a daily basis. To clarify, I did not mean or intend to imply that the Reading Police Department responds to the high school every day for drug issues. This is not the case. I meant in my remarks that we have seen a sharp increase in marijuana use, possession, and illness as a result of marijuana use and marijuana edibles among high school age youth recently. Our department deals with teenagers and marijuana on average every day. There is, in my opinion, a feeling among youth we encounter on calls for service that marijuana is okay now because of the law change, even though marijuana remains illegal for those under 21. The issue of drugs, including marijuana, opioids, and others, remain a leading cause of both crime and medical emergencies in our communities, and it is something we encounter every day as police officers. I hope this offers clarification. I regret any confusion. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sagal. I appreciate it. So for um, folks who are at the Board of Selectmen's meeting, um, public safety was presenting their budgets, and this was just a confusing statement that then got reprinted in the press. So I really appreciate Chief Sagala and um, Officer Abadi and Erica McNamara also came this evening. Um, I just would like to make a brief comment. I was at the uh, meeting, and I've been on the board of RACASA for uh, 10 or more years. I was um, actually in the room to sign the first bylaw, which was in this building before it was actually uh, demolished. But I really think it's, I think it's important to emphasize this point to parents. Um, so the scientific research search and evidence shows that known chemicals in marijuana act on and alter the developing brain, and that addiction to marijuana is a true fact. Rates of addiction are higher with early onset and use, early onset use and misuse. There's no doubt that this is a gateway to other drugs, immersing the users in drug culture. At a very minimum, regular use of marijuana dulls vibrant personalities and impedes motivation, changing the life of the addict, of the addicted person, and their family. Occasional use by adults with fully developed brains is seen as acceptable by some. Any use by children aged 12 to 21 uh, is illegal and a significant risk as it can lead to a pattern of regular use, which will negatively impact brain development. I urge parents who still think smoking weed is no big deal to immediately and aggressively re-educate themselves and become the parent who says no. We must be role models and firmly support that no to alcohol, marijuana, and other substance use by our preteen, teen, and young adult children. <coughs> and our, we have policies that in the school that support that. But the emphasis here is on what we see outside. And our, our EMS, I mean our fire and our police, our public safety respond within the community and they see all of this. Um, and they see the harm that it does. So again, the emphasis, while the schools and the school committee have policies in the school uh, working with the police and with RACASA have developed very strong policies. It can never take the place of what a parent can do in their home with education and care and support and attentiveness to what their children are doing. So I really appreciate um, all the support from the chief 
from uh, the police and from Rakasa. I don't know if Eric or Officer Abadi had anything to add or? I just want to make one more thing clear. Is that I, I couldn't ask for a better relationship that we have with Dr. Doherty in, in the school department as a whole. I go on record as saying that I think there couldn't be any closer of a relationship that the, the two of us work together hand in glove for mm -hmm. all the issues that we have, not just about drugs, but any mm -hmm. issue that comes up at any of the schools here in town. And I thank him for that too. Right. I, I just want to piggyback, that's why my hand was up, he <laughs> beat me to it. I, I want to piggyback on that because I, I think we have a very strong and unique relationship here in Reading that benefits kids mm -hmm. between the relationship between the school department and the police um, and also that we have a community coalition that's led by Erica um, and a very strong SRO and we've had we've been very fortunate we've had many strong SROs starting with Lieutenant Obadi several years ago that because of that relationship and the how we're, we share information together and um, that benefits kids and it benefits what we're trying to do here so there's always going to be problems but I think because we have that relationship it it solves it solves a lot of issues I mean I know he cringes when his phone rings at 9 o'clock <laughs> at night it's me but it is what it is sorry <laughs> thank you we thank appreciate you. you coming here to, to uh, make a yeah. statement anytime thank, thank you, you. Right. Um, something I actually wanted to say on Wednesday night at the meeting too is that I appreciate <coughs> this working relationship and I appreciate that we're heading into very tough budget <coughs> times and I would really like to underscore how important it is that we think proactively about continuing RACASA and making sure that the funding is there somehow to make sure that we're not scrambling at the end in danger of losing someone and some someone's and something that has been so vital to the progress um, stemming the tide even I mean I think it would be a lot worse if we didn't have Rakasa and it's a lot better because we do and so I want to just say forthrightly that I, we need to plan um, mm -hmm. ahead and not wait till the grants running out to figure out how we're going to pay for the continuation of this collaboration thank you thank you thank you thank you very much so we're going to move into the uh, begin the FY19 budget overview budget process mm -hmm. overview presentation and then as I said when um, when chair Robinson arrives we'll um, sort of go finish that out and then go back to the agenda and begin with the nomination great um, just to give a little context to what we're doing we've actually given this presentation a couple of times now we did it at parent university which was very well received we actually also used this when we had our first budget liaisons meeting so just to set the stage this is much more a 10,000 foot overview just to give some context as to how it's developed the various cost centers this actually is not meant to be a financial projection so there actually are no FY19 numbers as part of this what we really wanted to do was have this discussion such that we can allocate as much time as possible during the three meetings in January that will be presenting the numbers to focus on that <coughs> so thank you for allowing us to pull some of this forward so we'll, we're going to go through the budget process high-level overview of the FY19 budget which is really a quick recap of the financial forum that was held in October we'll talk about some of the ways we're working on communication and also give an update on the calendar for the upcoming January meetings and then if there are any questions as we go through it so the first thing that we wanted to do which again typically we do this in early January but we thought this would be a good opportunity now as we're starting to enter the budget season is just to go over a quick overview with folks of what we consider the three broad categories of funding sources that make up the overall budget there is the what we deem the operating budget that is the day-to-day -day expenses of the schools and the town so on the school side it's all of the salaries materials supplies and any services that get dedicated towards the students the revenues um, as we all heard during the October financial forum that's property taxes any state aid that we receive 
excise taxes, fees, and if there's any sale of lands, go into the pool of money that's available. As we'll probably say multiple times through this process, is that the property taxes can only increase two and a half two and a half percent per year for prop two and a half and then any new growth unless an override is presented and passed and then one thing that we do like to remind people is that at the end of the year any funds which are unencumbered and unspent get turned over back to the general fund we actually are not allowed to carry over any funding in the general fund mm -hmm. <coughs> the capital fund usually how I look at that that's typically um, through discussions we have with the town manager and town accountant targeted as 5% of the total operating budget. Those are items that are more significant capital improvements. So a couple of items to think about is if you have roof replacements, boiler replacements, district wide technology funds, those are more discreet in nature and are typically one time events as opposed to ongoing day to day operations. One thing that is being funded out of the capital plan over the next 10 years is the RMHS litigation that we talked about in the fall of last year. The other area that is part of our overall funding would be grants and revolving accounts. So the grants are funding we receive from state and federal mm -hmm. funding sources. And the revolving accounts, those are generated from user fees, tuition, so if um, kindergarten full day, kindergarten tuition, in-district students for special education, extended day, those types of programs, um, ticket sales, so football, hockey, items where we're, or drama where money is coming in that we can then utilize to help offset some other areas. Um, the item that we do remind <coughs> people throughout this process is that the grants and revolving funds are utilized for a very specific purpose. We cannot utilize funds out of a revolving account if it is not 100% tied to the generation of revenue from that account. And if I go too quick, mm -hmm. please stop me. I've had the going through these. What we did want to spend a couple of minutes on just to walk through, we do get a lot of questions about how our budget is prepared and voted on. So from a school committee standpoint, the school committee votes on the five cost centers. So they vote on the bottom line of each cost center as well as the total budget. And those five cost centers are the administration, regular day, special education. We have what's called the district-wide cost center, which are four of our smallest cost centers, athletics, extracurricular, health services, and um, network and technology and then we also have the facilities which this is purely the school facilities tomorrow night at the selectmen's meeting the town core and town facilities will be presented because those are part of the town budget ours is specifically just the school custodian side that's part of our budget so we go through and the school committee approves each one of those we are not allowed to transfer funds between the cost centers unless they have been approved through school committee. Mm -hmm. So I'll go through these, through these relatively quickly, but just to give everybody a reminder as to what makes up each of the cost centers. The administration cost center, which is the smallest of the cost centers, that is the central office. So the central office staff, within that is all of the Legal and auditing fees, we're required to have an audit each year, so the funding for that comes out of the administration. All of the employee recruiting and hiring, telecommunication services, um, miscellaneous supplies and expense or coffee or machine. We also have the tax sheltered annuity matching that comes out of that cost center as well, which is the contractual obligation under the teacher collective bargaining agreement. The next cost center, which is the largest of the cost centers is the regular day. So that is where all of the building administrators, so all of the principals, assistant principals, secretaries, all of the regular education, teachers, tutors, paraprofessionals, and any other support staff that supports the regular day process. Also within there are um, any of our specialists, <coughs> any 
in addition to the salaries, any types of mentors that <coughs> stipends and other stipends that are part of the collective bargaining agreement are in there. All of the curriculum materials, professional development, um, mandatory transportation for students is included in there as well. And then basically all of the day-to-day -day materials that support regular education are part of that cost center. Within the special education cost center, similar to regular <coughs> education, it includes all of the administrators, secretaries, so the team chairs are included within this. Um, Mrs. Wilson and her assistant are part of this. All of the special education teachers and paraprofessionals, and then any of the specialists <coughs> associated with special education. We also have um, an extended school year program that we run that is also part of the special education cost center. We do have any legal services associated with special, special education are part of this cost center. Um, home and hospital tutoring are part of that. Any outside consultative services we have are part of that. The other part, um, the two, I would say, more significant line items that are part of this are out-of-district transportation and out-of-district tuition. <coughs> so even though those are accommodated costs and when we go through those do get added back to our actual budget that we then manage and maintain so they do get added back to ours and that tends to be an area we have received some questions when people try to reconcile it for the district-wide programs those are the four relatively smaller call yeah. centers oh, sorry. Okay, can we just go I just want to um, clarify so the extended school year program is not the um, our after school extended day no extended school year is to provide services that are required for students per their education plans their mm -hmm. IEP or the special education plan it's not the it after is school not, extended day program it's not extended, extended day. school year is yes. very different okay I just wanted to highlight that I need to come up with a different word mm -hmm. than extended <laughs> yeah. okay and I didn't like some of the program oh, it just didn't sound right Okay. So the district-wide program, these are the four relatively small programs that we have combined together. So athletics, that includes an allocation of a high school principal, secretary, and coaches. So this call center is made up of all the officials, event details, crowd monitors associated with all of the various sports activities. It also includes equipment, field maintenance, and repairs. The largest expenses in this area are the facilities, rentals, and transportation. The rentals mainly are the pool and ice. The extracurricula, this is a relatively small call center. It includes an allocation of the assistant principal. It includes all of the um, stipends per the collective bargaining associated with extracurricular with the various shows. It also includes memberships, royalties, as well as transportation, and then any supplies and equipment that they have which are typically minimal the next two so health services that includes the director of nursing and all of our nurses are within this call center also school physician which is a service we actually outsource um, and then any medical supplies and equipment go through there so right now we have our AED machine so we have maintenance on those machines in order to ensure that they're always up and running that is funded out of this call center and then network networking and technology so that is the network manager and his technicians so his support is which are the computer technicians it includes the internet service software licensing um, so basically all of our maintenance and licensing agreements run through this call center because they're deemed to be district-wide so it's not just a regular day or a special ed so and a lot of this um, to give people a little bit of context why we appear to have so many different cost centers and accounts is because we're required to do very detailed reporting to DESE at the end of the year which breaks all of these out in very prescribed accounts and then the last area that we talked about is the facilities and this is the custodial manager all of the school custodians their equipment and supplies as well as um, the outsource cleaning service we have at college and the high school 
what's not in the budget these tend to be through grants donations user fees is typically field trip expenses those tend to go through if it's related to extracurricular with students pay a fee to go to them which covers the cost of the transportation and getting there um, Food services is completely, we are very fortunate, that is completely self-contained within its own revolving account. There are no general fund dollars that go towards it. Non-mandatory student transportation, we actually pay a fee for non-mandatory busing. The before and after school programs, which is the extended day programs that we were just talking about. A lot of the enrichment programs, which are through extended day or if we receive donations that go directly towards a specific enrichment program again to the extent we get donations and they are very specific we utilize the donations for the exact purpose they were given to us um, we are very fortunate that we do get a lot of donations for coaches for athletics as well as extracurricular um, we do have some that come in for tutoring and some of that may be through grants and then um, the fees we receive for kindergarten um, and preschool go into the revolving accounts and then to the extent we can take an offset, we take an offset for them. We did want to give a quick update on the grants. So there are a host of grants that we receive. Um, on the state grant side, we received the racial imbalance, which is our Medco grant. The other part of state reimbursements we receive is what we refer to as circuit breaker, and that is reimbursement for special education expenses for out-of-district tuition. So that is an annual amount we receive from the so state. So that circuit breaker is based on some factor of the foundations? Mm -hmm. There's some formula for that? It's, it's not all of the expenses. It's probably. not all of some, the some expenses. Portion. What is, what's that formula again? You have so it's based on the foundation amount and then we get reimbursement depending on allocation of a percentage over the foundation. So right now we're budgeting. It's over like three or four times the foundation. Yes, so it's about $42,000. Once we hit over $42,000 on either a student in district or out of district, the state reimburses us this year we're so typically the state historically has reimbursed at about 70 to 72 percent. This year they cut it to 65 percent reimbursement. So why don't we save any questions to the end just so she can get through the presentation. Thank you. The other grants we receive, um, we've broken them down. Entitlement grants, so that's our Title I, Title IIa. The Special Ed IDEA grant this year we received a new Title IV, hmm. which is a relatively small amount, but we'll, we'll take it. Um, and then the last two are also special education um, grants that typically go, one is for um, professional development and the other one is typically for the preschool. And then the one federal grant we receive, which is a competitive grant, which is a five-year grant, is the School Climate Transformation Grant, which we have two more years left on that. That was a five-year award. What we did want to show people is what we have seen happening in the grants. So in the current year, our total grant funding has decreased by $260,000. Overall, we are not sure what will happen in fiscal 19. So we are looking at this as we're building the budget to make sure we're taking that into account. And as um, Carolyn had gone over, we also within the special ed IDEA grant, there is a portion of that that we do have to proportionate share allocate out to any <coughs> private school students attending any of the schools within writing a portion of our grant gets allocated towards that student population. So we will continue to monitor this. What we've also seen is the grants are also coming out later and later during the year. There are some grants that still the amounts have not come out and the special ed program improvement, which is the PD grant, just came out last week and it, we did see that that was almost a $19,000 decrease mm -hmm. in our allocation. So I will turn it over. Thank you. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through this part and then turn it back over to Gail. Um, and so, you know, why are we in the situation that we're in? I, I think all of us in this room understand that is that as a whole property taxes can only go up two and a half percent each year plus new growth. Um, there is not a large commercial tax base in the town of Reading and new growth is limited, although there is some long-term plans already in place that, that are starting to, sh to reap some benefits from that. 
We have expenses that go higher than 2.5%. Uh, mostly those are in accommodated costs, um, which we'll talk, to, talk about in a little bit. Health insurance, special education, um, and other accommodated costs tend to go up higher than that 2.5%. The Chapter 70 funding formula is not as sufficient. And over the last four years, I'm going to show you a graph, we've received approximately 100% increase each year. So why is that happening in Reading and maybe not in other communities is because as part of the formula, they look at the property values um, in the community and the, afford the, the ability to afford education. And that is one of the things that actually is working against us in the formula. And you will see that we're getting what is called the hold harmless amount each year, which is about $25 per student which is about a 1% increase in the aid each year, about $100,000. As we all know, the override did not pass in October of 2016. And really, in order to maintain a level service budget, the budget should be around 35 to 4% a year um, to keep the same services from one year to the next year. So this is a chart that I was just mentioning about the Chapter 70 education funding. Uh, over the last several fiscal years, you can see in the last four fiscal years, um, the percent increase has been about 1%, which is about $100,000 per year. How do we compare with our comparable communities? Um, so we take a look at about 37 communities, which in also include contiguous communities and middle sex league, as well as um, communities that are similar um, to Reading. And you can see that uh, is when you're looking at the per pupil that Reading is ranked 30th out of 37. And if I have in discussions with members of the community, um, I don't know if, you know, if there's quite an understanding of how the per pupil is, number is generated. Uh, so this is part of a, 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 a report that, that Gail puts together uh, around the October-November time frame, which take a, takes a look at expenses uh, not only in the school department budget, but um, services that maybe the town would provide as well. And so through that, the state calculates a per pupil expenditure. It's the same, it's the same um, end of year report that every community has to submit. So it's the same information, the same data. Um, and so even a slight increase of say $200 would generate about eight hundred to $900,000 additional funding in the school department budget. So even that small of an increase would have a significant impact. Um, but you can see this is you know, comparable uh, to other communities where, where Reading lies. Here's a uh, line graph that shows over the last several years um, where the state average is compared to, to where, where Reading is. Reading is in the blue and the state average is in the red. And then another chart that, that we have shown in the past is where we rank for per pupil expenditure. And you can see in FY06, um, we were up at around 232. And over the last several fiscal years, we're around the high 200s, um, low 300 range. Um, and so again, it's, it's not necessarily the, the major dip in the, in the line that's the issue. It's, it's the fact that we have not stayed at a consistent level over, over time. Um, and that means that other communities are, are going over ahead of us in terms of the amount that they're spending on their, on their per pupil. And so that also affects how you compare to other communities, how you're competing for, for the same resources, for the same type of staffing, things like that. So then this, the next couple of slides is just a quick overview of most of this was discussed at the October 11th financial forum, but just to put it into context as we move into the budget process is that, and some of this was slightly accelerated this year. So a lot of these numbers were done a little bit earlier than they have in the past in order for us to do. I know the selectmen meetings are last week and this week and our start in early <coughs> January. So in October, the town manager and town accountant look at all of the ava available revenues in order to determine the total pool of money that's available to be allocated. Also at that time, they do determine um, the accommodated costs. So that then determines the amount of expenses that are subtracted from the revenue and then the remainder is what then gets allocated between the town and school <coughs> to the operating budgets. 
so that's how that <coughs> basically works and typically the schools allocated share of the residual amount is about 64 <coughs> percent these are um, the slides that the town manager presented at the October financial forum which walks through the projected revenue and some of the high-level assumptions we do want to let folks know that we have been working with the town manager and the town accountant as we've been pulling our budgets together and we do anticipate there's going to be a slight adjustment to these slides based upon a review of the projected revenue numbers so we are anticipating that there will be a slight increase to our accommodated costs as well as our operating budget it's about hundred and twelve thousand dollars is where we are and some of that will be split between the schools and the town so we're in the process of finalizing that information so that is good news we're very fortunate and happy that we have we do have a really close relationship and we're <coughs> having a lot of discussions with them as we're going through some of our numbers um, so these are the, the typical assumptions that they use each year again it's not an exact science because it is very early in the year um, so some of it is property taxes based upon new growth so if people are building additions and whatnot they have that the excise tax again it's a little bit difficult because you may have a great year where everyone goes out and buys a new car and then it sort of stagnates for a few years and then you may have a pop again so they, they tend to look at historical averages and then true it up as as we go throughout this process um, the intergovernmental revenues the largest number of that is the chapter 70 funding which we just talked about has very minimal because we're at the hold harmless amount um, one area that comes up quite frequently is that these numbers are best estimates I don't want to say best guess but best guess estimates but there is also we have discussions with the FinCom throughout the process to the extent any of these change by a significant number they have voted that they would help to fund any shortfall within these numbers because it is um, at this point very early in the year when you think we're talking about a budget that's well over 12 months from now so the accommodated costs these are the items that come off the top and main these are typically items that are mandated that have to be paid so within that is benefits um, the town manager works very closely with all of the collective bargaining <coughs> units to come up with the benefits they work very closely through that as we talked about the capital funding comes off as part of that and that is to make sure even though the operating side is extremely important if you're not maintaining your buildings and your equipment eventually that is going to come back um, and haunt you so we always want to make sure while we are continuing to fund the operating <coughs> that the capital piece is also very significant in order to keep the safety and maintenance of all of the buildings the debt piece is part of that and then we have um, all of the energy costs we talked about the education so that is the special education out of district um, as well as tuition goes into that number when we're building this we also factor in the circuit breaker reimbursement we are going to get so that's actually a net number since we know we're getting that that's already factored into the accommodated costs <coughs> and as you can see those costs tend to rise over five percent per year so that goes to what um, Dr. Darty was saying earlier that as those costs continue to rise that amount of money comes off the top and if your revenue is not increasing at the same rate there's less available to be distributed um, we talked about some of the driving factors are health care which does continue to to rise and then the out of district for us the biggest driver this year is that as we showed earlier due to state funding we're receiving two hundred thousand dollars less in circuit breaker relief so this is just a quick summary to show again that for fiscal 19 revenue projections are anticipated to be just under three percent accommodated costs 5.7 percent and again these numbers are going to change slightly but um, we will show those numbers as we proceed through the budget process so what we wanted to show is how because we do get a lot of questions about how that number then gets allocated and then the pieces go apart and the pieces go together so for the total budget it's about um, I need better glasses 62 percent um, non accommodated 38 percent accommodated is how that works out so the 38 percent 
gets carved out. It's the 62% then that then gets split between the town and the school. <coughs> so you can see this is what the total pie looks like. So you have the split between the municipal side, the school side, and the accommodated side. So what we do, because we have realized that it does get confusing for folks, is when they look at us and they say, how did you present a $42 million budget when you only had a $38 million budget? That is because the accommodated costs that we walked through earlier get added back to the school budget and the town budget, and we are responsible for managing those, even though they're carved out as accommodated costs. So that is why the number looks like it's larger <coughs> than it should be. So we are in the process of preparing what we call a level service budget. So it's basically doing a bottom-up budget of everything that exists in the current year, putting everyone through <coughs> any contractual collective bargaining agreement increases and any known increases. We will then compare that to the actual amount of money we've been allocated and that will determine the deficit we have and that's what we will be presenting in January. So we will be presenting two budgets. One will be the baseline budget which will be the balanced budget which will tie to the number that has been allocated from the town and then the step second part is what we would call a restorative budget for discussion in case there is an override that is presented, that we will present that as part of um, the school committee process in January. So we will present them separate and distinctly so everyone will know what the budget is. So as we're developing the FY19 baseline budget, which will be the superintendent's recommended budget, it will be a balanced budget. These are the priorities we're, we're looking at right now. Certainly we want to focus our priorities on the district improvement plan, which the school committee um, did, did vote to support in, in the October, November time frame. Those are the four areas that you see there that our focus is going to be on. We certainly want to also keep class sizes in, in grades K through 2 between 18 and 22 students. Um, we want to make sure that the middle school interdisciplinary model um, is kept as a priority and that our high school juniors and seniors have access to the coursework that they need for graduation um, and also that we focus the, uh, the time and effort and energies um, on the Josh Eaton School Improvement Plan process. So as we were developing and we are developing the FY19 uh, superintendent's recommended budget that will go to the school committee, these are the areas that we're focusing on around the, the teaching and learning piece. Um, as we move forward. These are the drivers that we are identifying as we're developing this budget. So certainly you have your contractual step and color increases for represented and non-represented employees. Um, as, as the school committee knows and the, I think the community knows, um, we negotiated one year contracts for all of our five collective bargaining units. So that means that we are going to be renegotiating contracts again this year with all of the collective bargaining units. So we'll be starting that process again shortly. Um, as Gail mentioned, there'll be an increase in special education, tuition, transportation expenses. That's that accommodated cost number that you saw earlier. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I do want to spend a, a minute on and, and is to talk a little bit about the, the seven FTE middle school teachers that were um, restored last year late in the budget process and what needed to be done to restore those positions. So the $450,000 came through a combination of several areas. One of those areas is that there was $100,000 of free cash allocated as a one-time amount for the school department budget. That was not put on the base for this year. So what that means is, is that that would need to be made up in an FY19 budget. In addition, the other remaining $350,000 were one-time cuts that we made in expenses that we would not be able to sustain. So we cut, if you remember, we cut the per pupil at our building levels by 100,000. We cut technology by 50,000 from 100,000. Um, we reduced the substitute teacher line item uh, to balance the budget by 98,000. Um, so all of those things, when you put them all together, those are all unsustainable expense levels. 
that next year we need to build back into the budget. So we are already starting with a $450,000 hole as we are developing the FY19 budget. So although, although we did restore the seven teachers for this year, um, that was a one-time Band-Aid approach to, to, to try to make sure that we kept the middle school model intact and so that um, with the hope that there would be an, an opportunity in the FY19 budget to get additional revenue. Mm -hmm. um, the other things that are driving the budget is the state circuit breaker program, which Gail talked about. It's a $200,000 decrease. Um, we are seeing, and we've been already told by both the um, ICE Authority and the YMCA that there will be increases in uh, rental fees. Um, we've also, we are in a, under a contract for transportation and we have known increases there. Um, we are going to see an increase in our contractual cleaning service. We have that known increase for next year. And we are up for renewal of all of our antivirus protection and other software programs. It's something that we do every three years so that we can get a better discount. So you pay a one-time amount every three years. And so next year, lucky us, is the year that we have to renew. So those are all projected budget drivers, and we will certainly go into those in more detail when we present to you the budget in um, January. These are some of the guiding principles that were discussed in October um, at the school committee meeting. Um, as you can see here, there's actually two slides on this, uh, and they range from you know, making sure that obviously students are the top priority, not to use any gimmicks or use of you know, increasing offsets artificially for one year and then going back, um, making sure that we're keeping you know, the social, emotional, intellectual, academic lenses of, of the child intact. Um, on this slide here, we want to make sure that we're focusing on core academics, the science curriculum, um, making sure that we balance our cuts across levels. Um, and I think you could see here that, so this is the guiding principles that we received um, in October from the school committee. Uh, certainly we will do everything we can to follow these principles, but a lot of these are competing for each other, so it is not you know, there, there are going to be times when we're not going to be able to follow all these. So, the, the last piece of this that we want to um, just focus on is the communication piece and the timeline. And so, are we communicating this process? Well, Mrs. Dowd and I have gone through several school council and PTO meetings over the last couple of months. And we've been doing a very similar presentation for them that we've done here tonight. With you, I went to Barrows this afternoon and talked at their school council meeting about the process. Um, we have brought in over 20 budget liaisons, and we've started educating them on the budget process. Every school is represented. We also have community member as part of the process. Um, their role is to really be the communication pipeline um, to help educate the greater community and the schools about what is going on with the budget process. We are sending out budget bulletins. We've done three already in our newsletters um, and how that is being communicated. We will continue to do that as we go through the process. The budget bulletins are meant to be short, one page, no more than that, which are going to hit all the, the, the key bullet points about the topic around the budget. Um, certainly the school committee meetings is a key part and the ongoing community discussions. So these are all ways that we are communicating this whole FY19 budget process um, to the greater community and we'll continue to identify other ways as well. And then finally the calendar, um, and we have changed the calendar a couple of times just based on what we're observing um, could be happening looking ahead into January. So. The, tonight is, is, I guess you could say, kind of the kickoff. We're, we're doing like a pre-budget process overview for you. January 8th is when we will be begin our school committee presentations. We'll be doing the three smallest cost centers and school capital. Um, we then will be on January 10th doing the two largest cost centers. So by January 10th, all of the major budget presentations will be over. On January 11th, um, we are anticipating a large contingency for the public hearing. 
So we have moved, originally we had special education on January 11th. We have now moved that to the 10th to provide more time for the public hearing. Also on that night, we will be doing the override <coughs> budget presentation. And that will be after the public hearing. On the 16th, it will provide opportunity for the school committee to ask questions, um, and to get any uh, information answered. And then on the 18th uh, will be the final vote. The next day we would then present to the town manager the school committee budget. The town manager then will begin putting together his budget, which he will present to FinCom um, at the end of January. Um, and then the school department budget presentation to FinCom will be on the 7th. So that's, that's the calendar. Um, the one change from the last time is that we are moving uh, special education to the same night as regular day. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is it. Mm -hmm. John, did you? As far as all the words left in the word. Thank you. Sorry about that. Any committee questions about that presentation? Yes. Very good overview. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I had a question about accommodating costs. And so one of the things that I mentioned that out of district, we talked last week about out of district special ed. Are, so accommodated costs, be, is it correct to say that they're shared between the town and the schools? And the school budget. So there's a portion of an accommodated cost. So if we have special ed expenses that are accommodated costs, are, is a, are a portion of those costs paid outside the school budget? They are not paid. I wouldn't no. say they're outside no. of the school budget. What happens is the way it works is they have the total revenue. That I speak with my hand, so I apologize. There's the total revenue that is available from revenue. There is a 100% subtraction for all accommodated costs, whether or not they are town or school. So all of the benefits, which is a combination of town and school <coughs> employees, are part of that number. The debt, which is a combination of town and school, energy combination of town and school the out special ed out of district and transportation is a 100 percent school expense but because it is mandated it is part of the accommodated because we actually have we actually cannot pay that so if if something were to happen we would be obligated to pay that expense it's not an item i can turn around and say i'm just not going to fund it um so it, it's a non-discretionary item to do that and then um, the debt pieces. So all of those are a 100% one for one come off the top from revenue. So I'm not sure if that's <coughs> answering. So some of them are both town and school related and the special ed one is a 100% school, school related. related. I don't believe we're sending yeah. any town employees out of school. No, I, I just wanted to clarify that just because there was discussion last week about mm -hmm. moving 270,000 so, for regular yes. day so what special we ed. Did, I want people to be clear on yes. what we were doing. So what, what we, we did for that one when we presented the first quarter update to the school committee last week is we had gone through and looked at all of the various items within that and we did have some salary savings through either open positions hiring differences so since we had the salary savings we deemed it was appropriate at this point to transfer those salary savings to the special ed cost center in order to fund the deficit we are having related to out of district transportation. That's an item we will continue to monitor throughout. And if we come to a point where we are not able to fund it through salary savings, that is an item that we would go back to the town either through finance committee or town meeting in April to explain the situation and request additional funding but we felt that since we had the salary savings available and some of them were open positions that were resulting in us having additional expenses within special education that that was the prudent decision was to self-fund it yes oh just, follow up. just so to be clear the school is responsible for 100% of the special ed costs. That's what correct. I that is correct. Yes, that for, is correct. For anybody who was listening to both conversations, yes, and might we are 100% responsible. But we do know that there is an avenue for us, such that if our accommodated costs, which are not discretionary, that we do have two avenues available to us to go back to the town to request additional funds. Thank you. Ms. Webb. No, I well, appreciate clarifying that. I think for people who have been here 
before we did the accommodate the, the accommodated came about so that we could assure that these non-discretionary items like the <coughs> benefits and special education would get funded and the idea that there could also be a community priority that might cross the schools and the municipal functions that might then um, that that would be a way to sort of get that funding prioritized sort of above either the municipal or the school budget but it, that, that and, was and that it didn't become a debate on town meeting floor for right. more money <coughs> so I don't remember when we how many years ago we did that now but accommodated any other questions that was premium okay. so uh, yes I oh, can ask after you go ahead and ask no, I was just going to ask about the um, budget representatives I know we're calling it representatives now. Liaisons. liaisons not parents because it can be people from the citizenry not just families are those positions all filled now and closed yes okay it Didn't was advertised we we had a deadline and, and yes. we had our kickoff meeting last late month. late November yeah okay I was asked if there were still openings so I wanted to make sure thank you I just have a quick question so the um, I it was slide 14 IDEA went down um, the change is down six thousand dollars but the um, that doesn't reflect any movement of proportionate share funds that would come out of that one million and fourteen thousand right. that would have to go to support special education of students in private schools in Reading Correct. or Reading students just no in Reading. okay just in Reading. all right just I know that's any a complicated student, thing. any student Reading. any student in but Reading. not Reading students that go special outside education. of Reading. The key there was it could be a student from Bill Ricca, but in Reading at a private school, yeah. and we have to allocate the proportionate share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that number doesn't include it. No, this was no. purely if you were to look on Desi's website yeah. and it said, here's your IDEA mm -hmm. grant in here. Yeah. So we have the same proportionate share, if you will, for our Title IIA grant. We also have to carve out a certain amount of money for the two private schools within Reading and now we have that for the IDEA grant. Do you have any guidance on what to do next for FY19? We do not. What what I have been building in is looking at what the decreases have been and assuming that we will see a continued trend of that. So when I'm looking at I'll, I'll pick on the IDEA grant because we love that one so much. Um, our largest grant, the bulk of that grant is salaries. So we do know between proportionate share and decreased funding that some of the teacher salaries we have on that grant, we actually need to pull into the operating budget. And I would rather err on being slightly conservative and assume if it went down 8% this year that it will go down another 8% next year because that is everything we're hearing is that the state funding and grant funding is getting tighter and tighter. The one that was a little bit of a shock to us was the program improvement grant. That one, the numbers just came out last mm -hmm. week and we saw an almost $19,000 decrease in that one. And they, a couple of the others that we're still waiting on, they're, they're basically cutting the number of people that are el eligible for it. So I do anticipate this trend will continue we, into the foreseeable we, we are being told to assume that federal grants all the federal grants will eventually Please disappear out. is there any questions for the public anyone else can you clarify one thing for me um is special education and transportation out of the operational budget but tuition is out of special education transportation is part of the accommodated yeah. it's part of the Costs. accommodated yes it's but when you operating. when you moved over funds we so moved I, it I out of the regular day into special education because it we did not take away from I don't want to say operational but we didn't not take away from any of the mandated operational building based budget the transfer we did was a line item by line item person by person view to say where did we have salary savings where did we have positions okay. that hadn't been filled where do we have unpaid leads and we looked at that as a pool of money that was available across the board and that is the only funding that we're transferring we did not touch any other regular day curriculum professional development right. building based okay. budgets that are not items that we would deem this was purely because we knew we had positions that were vacant okay 
Thank you. I can. Yes. Love is sharp. I don't think that word. So much for the next one. Now, which ones of those grants have a limited time associated with them? So the ones that are one year. The um. The idea. The. The, the one, um well the technically trans, the no brand has a the way that it works the metco the racial imbalance you have one year to utilize that if you do not spend it down by june 30th you return the funds to the state the idea grant used to work that way but because now they've added proportionate share holdbacks you actually now that one falls under the you do have the ability to roll funds for two years so that's more of a 24 month grant they strongly recommend and urge you to spend it down in the first year and it's usually a small percentage that you can carry over they, again because the proportionate share is such a challenging number they're allowing districts to carry funds over because if you don't and they deem you did not do your allocation correctly they'll take it out of your future grant so um, that one they allow you to the Early education, the program improvement, the early childhood improvement, those are all, you have to use them within the school year. So interestingly enough, the special ed program improvement, the one that just came out last week, that will have to be spent down by August 31st. So they didn't say we gave you the grant four months later than we normally do. We're going to give you four months to spend it. They basically just said you still have to spend it in the same time frame even though we gave you four, four less months to spend it. Um, Title I, Title IIA, those you have the rollover capability so you can roll that one into the second year. There are limits on how much you can roll over. Um, the Title IVA, that's a new one this year. My I think it's understanding similar. is it's similar because those all go together. Um, the DSAC grant, that one I don't believe we're getting that this year. That was one where you only had 12, you only had the school year in which to spend it. The state treasurers, that's actually one that um, Reading Cooperative Bank worked with us last year to get. That was a one year and we did a, um, a life fair we did with the high school students to show them how to do a budget and everything. So we knew that was a one year. That was a great, the students had a great time with that one. The school climate transformation grant, we are very fortunate that we are allowed to carry that forward. They're looking at that as a five-year grant. So we're allowed to continue to roll forward unused funds as long as we have a plan to no. spend it down. The circuit breaker, you can have a year in reserve for that fund. So the way we are utilizing it so that we have budget certainty is the numbers you're seeing up there. So the 860000 is actually this year's grant from the state that we are holding for a year that we will utilize next year. So you're allowed to carry 12 months forward and for that grant. Know how much that's, mm -hmm. right. that's why we worked towards that model. There are many districts right now that budgeted 70%, that received 65%, that now have to cover that yeah. gap. So we feel this is a much more prudent way is to budget with facts certain one year in advance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So before we go on to the to the next uh, topic, I just wanted to say historically uh, we've always asked the FinCom to uh, present questions prior to their meeting uh, with the school committee, and, and we'd like to continue that process uh, as there as they are the representatives of town meeting on 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 budget and financial matters. But over the last couple years or so, it's gotten out of hand where uh, everyone's sending emails to the uh, central office uh, with lists and lists of questions. Uh, you know, we have obviously can answer some questions, but uh, we prefer that if people have, if public members have questions that they try to get to the meetings uh, to ask them or uh, come or approach a school committee member uh, to ask a question uh, we, we it just I mean it you know we we have uh, our director of, of finance spending I'm, I'm not kidding it days just going through questions and we don't want to stop questions they're important 
but please try to come out to the meetings and ask them and and not uh, inundate central office with emails at the day before the presentation thank you it, the yeah. only thing I just want to add to that is where we have such a compressed budget time we, there's essentially only 10 days it's not going to be physically possible to answer the uh, the 150 plus questions that were answered last year yeah. and, and and no question will go unanswered right, right. Uh, we'll answer just uh, if people can utilize the the or residents can utilize the the meeting dates I know they're going to the selectmen's meetings and come to these meetings and we'll stay here until all the questions are answered yes I think in the summertime when we were laying out kind of the process I, I thought we had talked about <coughs> that all of the boards school committee um, selectmen FinCom would post for all of the meetings so that generally we kind of, because it is such a compressed schedule, mm -hmm. that we used to, well, you know, uh, select them, we'll go over their stuff, and then you guys would do your thing, and go to FinCom, and, you know, people could go, but because it's so compressed, I thought we were, I basically, all of us posted for all of the meetings so that, you know, if FinCom had a question during the regular day, I mean, it could get answered, kind of asked and answered on the floor, not that you wouldn't answer an email question or something that someone had sent in, but the fact that we would all sort of agree that we would sort of all be at each other's meetings. Um, yeah, no, and I'm talking beyond, uh, I I know you're, you know, the, the boards, I'm just talking in general public members as well uh, that, uh, you know, that, that are engaged, but, you know, not necessarily coming to the meetings, but digging a uh, digging the budget apart and coming up with a bunch of questions. It just it would help them if they came and asked them. Oh, you guys left out cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is right after the holidays. There yeah. might be some leftover yeah. cookies. Yeah. I think um, we also have office hours, and uh, I know. I mean, I certainly on January 10th we could. I, I'm sure I can do an office hour. We totally. could probably add. So that we had office hours in front of these, um, you know, at least the three meetings in January, and an office idea. half hours, mm -hmm. um, so that that would help. And I think it's, um, you know, it's just imperative that we are able to. Um, I help. also have office hours three times a week. And it, Dr. Doherty does. And again, I, I, I just in closing like to say there's no we we respect and want the questions we just and they'll all get answered but uh, we just gotta kind of spread that around a little bit so that it's not uh, tying up uh, Gail 24 <coughs> seven. So, thank you uh, I apologize for coming in late and uh, we uh, we're gonna have the uh, appointment of a new school committee member I'd like to do that now I don't know whether the board wants to Board of Select and want to come up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're only four. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Yep. So, so as as uh, as, it, as everyone knows, uh, Dr. Nyan uh, had to resign uh, from the committee, and and we've uh, posted uh, to uh, fill his his seat until the next election, and. Uh, we are very uh, thankful uh, and appreciate that uh, Sherry Vandenactor applied uh, to that position. And uh, I don't know, if based, what I'd like to do is if you could say a few words and then if anybody has any questions from that, we can go from there. Is that fair? Good. Okay, great. Hi. Thank you for inviting me tonight. I did prepare a few remarks, and if you don't mind, I'd probably like to read them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight, and I look forward to our discussion together. Uh, before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge Dr. Nyan for his many years of dedicated service to our schools as an educator, an administrator, and a school committee member. As a parent, I'm really grateful for his service, and I wish him and his family health and healing um, in the upcoming months. So thank you. I want to also acknowledge my Jewish colleagues who are here rather than being at home celebrating Hanukkah tonight. Thank you for coming out. And uh, the selectmen who have had many, many meetings this month on the budget, and this is yet another one. So thank you to you also for coming out tonight. Um, I trust you've read my application materials. Uh, perhaps there are some viewers who haven't, and so I'd like to give a little overview of my academic history and credentials. And I feel that's especially important because I'll be replacing someone, if I'm appointed tonight, uh, who is an educator. I have lived in Massachusetts all my life. I'm a first generation college student. I graduated from a public high school. I was truly blessed with the opportunity to attend Mount Holyoke College where I majored in English. I received a scholarship that allowed me to study in Canterbury, England in my junior year and that was probably the most educational year of my life actually. Upon graduating from Mount Holyoke, I served as a VISTA volunteer and that program is Volunteer in Service to America known as the Domestic Peace Corps, and that was started by President Johnson. I worked in Holyoke, Massachusetts with the Sisters of Providence, <laughs> wonderful nuns, and did capacity building work in their shelters for homeless men, shelter for homeless women and children, and their household goods distribution program. After I served as a VISTA, I went on to graduate school, and I earned a master's degree and a PhD in English from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I've subsequently earned a graduate certificate in instructional technology for educators at New Mass Boston. I have more than 25 years of classroom and administrative experience in education, beginning with my work as a teaching assistant back in UMass in my 20s. Since 1999, I've taught writing, literature, and academic skills at Springfield College's School of Professional and Continuing Studies in Boston. And I'm the school, a school-wide writing across the curriculum coordinator. In that role, I train faculty from a range of disciplines to develop curriculum and adopt high-impact <coughs> teaching approaches that help students master traditional literacy skills like reading and writing and also emerging literacies and competencies such as information literacy, critical thinking, and creative problem solving. I've been elected to faculty senate twice and appointed to committees to revise the school's general education program and amend our faculty bylaws. I bring that up because they're large and complex tasks. They're difficult tasks. And I'm respected for my willingness to see multiple points of view on contentious issues uh, to degree robustly but respectfully and to dig into details and develop creative approaches that help break through impasse. I understand that education is complex, that every challenge we face is multifaceted and multilayered, and I believe the skills I've gained through my experience will be assets as we move through the budget process and as we work together to set the district's priorities for teaching and learning. Going back to Springfield College, I really believe in the college's mission to educate the whole person in spirit, mind, and body. So that is, I believe we have to teach our children the essential knowledge, skills, and competencies that they're going to need to succeed in the emerging digital world, to succeed in careers that don't even exist today in many cases. I also understand that we have to inculcate attitudes and behaviors that will allow our youth to thrive and I hope mend a society with unprecedented levels of stress, disparity, and polarization. I deeply value another aspect of Springfield's mission, and that's to educate students for leadership and service to others. Like all of you here tonight, I too deeply believe in community service, and that's why I served as a VISTA volunteer, why I co-chaired the Joshua Eaton Task Force, why I joined the board of ARCASA, why I developed an educational program for RCTV, and why I ran for a seat on the board of library trustees, and why I submitted in my application for this position, why I'm here tonight. I view our community as an organism. 
I believe that the health of one part affects the health of all the other parts. I believe that strong and healthy schools contribute to a strong and healthy community and vice versa. The stronger our community, the stronger our schools. I believe that we will rise together or we'll fall together. That we'll thrive together or we'll stagnate together. Like it or not, I believe we're all interconnected in this town. I subscribe to the notion of an intergenerational compact, where as a community we take care of each other, we invest in each other, and as our ancestors did, we act intentionally to leave a proud legacy to our future generations. I'll base every decision I make as a school committee member on a simple but profound question. What's best for the 4,500 children in our schools and by extension the 20,000 adults that are connected to them in this community? Because we'll be facing complex issues in the coming months and years, at times we might disagree how to best answer that question, but I hope you will never have cause to doubt my intentions. If I'm appointed to fill this opening, and if the voters choose to elect me in April, I'm committed to using my role on school committee for the benefit of our whole community. Our children, of course, but also our adults and our elders. I view our public schools much like our public library and our police force and our senior center as a resource that benefits all of us, directly and indirectly. I'll work to the best of my ability to expand our school's role in promoting, promoting lifelong learning in building community and to strengthen our proud public education legacy for my children who are in these schools and also for your children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said. Does anyone have any questions? No? <laughs> I, I, w I wish um, that was my resume, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. thank you. I'm very impressive, and uh, you. I think it's um, just the right strengths and capacity at the right time. And I appreciate you being willing to yeah. to um, step up to the appointment. I really would consider it a privilege to serve with the sport. Thank you, John, and, and I look forward to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, actually, I had a, I, I had a, a, a question. I, my resume is one page. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so clearly, you have the bona fides to do this job. Um, you know, to, to know what you do, your teaching experience, your administrative experience, all the work you've done. I mean, that, that, that's a question. So, um, I guess my question is more of a practical one, and I actually was writing this down as you were talking sort of about um, breaking in passes, um, intergenerational compact, mm -hmm. working with the community. Now, obviously, the school community set the priorities in the budget for the 4,500 kids, and obviously, it impacts the family. But the thing that you said that was really profound um, was the sort of connection between um, what the schools do and the rest of the community. Lately, and especially if you read some of the survey comments that the, the mm -hmm. selectmen survey, it just seems to be. I read them all. <laughs> digging in, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of, uh, and we and we have sort of. Um, I'm not going to say factions. That's not the right word, but there's sort of disagreements between whether you have kids in the public schools or you don't have kids in the public schools. Whether you lived here 50 years ago or you moved in here 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a senior or whether you're a working person with two people trying to pay the mortgage on the house you paid. $20,000 over asking. So um, can you talk a little bit about sort of some of the strategies you use? How you would talk about um, implementing that, not just for the schools, because we're going to have an override vote in April. How are, you know, how would you work with the school committee and also, you know, with the rest of us? And what were the things that you, how, how would you sort of implement that? How would you message that? Because mm -hmm. that, I think, is really kind of, you struck a really, really powerful nugget um, that all of us could learn from. So. 
if you have some answers you'd like to share, I'd really love to know. Just a point of correction error. We may have been in April. Uh, that was quite a question. <laughs> that was quite a question. I think that although we have some divisions in our town and as John notes in our state and our country, I think that we actually have more in common. And I think we have to identify what we have in common. And I think that what we have in common is a desire to uh, leave something for the next generation and to take care of our elders. It's the intergenerational compact. I think that we have shared values of community. And I do think that the schools can be helpful in the sense that uh, learning is becoming a lifelong endeavor, as we know. And the schools, I think, can continue to offer programs like we've been seeing with uh, Parent University. See, I'm looking for Sandy, who isn't here. That was such a powerful program for families. And there was even questions from the school committee already about how can we extend programs like that, say, to our elders. Uh, how can we build on programs like the reading program at Joshua Eaton, where elders do get to share their experience with our kids and teach our kids and be engaged with our kids. So we have some structures in place that we can replicate and develop and build. I actually have already started talking with RPS administration about um, perhaps partnering with a community college. Um, a lot of them in Boston are bursting at the seams. Uh, yes, Bunker Hill started offering midnight classes a couple of years ago. Their classrooms are so full. And I wonder if we can work with the community college maybe to offer classes here. Uh, Seniors can take classes tuition free, I believe, at community colleges. What if we offered something like a geriatric certificate so people who are leaving the workforce could get retrained to work with their neighbors, for instance? What if we offered an early childhood program so moms maybe going back into the workforce could get trained to do work they would find meaningful and maybe some of the internship programs could help support programs like RISE. So uh, I think if we really keep our eye on the ball of community-wide education and maybe even partnering some more with the library that's also engaged in that work, that that might help um, bring some of the different sectors of the community together on common ground. So that's one idea I had. Thanks. Yes. I Thanks. just wanted to say I'm eager to tap your experiences <laughs> and your skills in your resume and, and just now you talked about your interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. to learning and how that's coupled with um, that what Dr. Ann, Anna Ornstein also talked about, the difference that's between great. teaching and learning and actually engaging the student's heart, mind, soul, and body in the learning experience. Mm -hmm. And, but you didn't just mention that in terms of the students, you mentioned it in terms of the teachers as well. And, and bringing all um, dimensions of the school experience into the beneficial learning equation. And so hearing these ideas and reading and hearing about that, I'm really excited <laughs> to be able to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Yep. We'll move to appoint Sherry Vandenacker to the Reading School Committee to replace Dr. Gary Nyan. Second. And this re requires a roll call vote. Uh, Dan? Yes. 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 Enthusiastic yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 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 Only two minutes. <laughs>
to uh, call the meeting uh, back to order. Uh, I, move. Um, I can uh, move to approve the consent agenda. Is there second. A second. Any anyone have anything they'd like to remove? All those in favor? Five zero. <laughs> Did we already do the uh, any the North Shore education? Did you have something that you wanted to present on that page? Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, as you know, we are a member of um, the North Shore Education Consortium, Special Education Collaborative. Um, in the Articles of Agreement, which I've included in your packet, uh, there is a clause that when there is ever a community that is requesting to become a member, that uh, not only does the board have to approve it, which the board did approve, um, which I'm a member of that board, but each school <coughs> committee has to approve as well. Um, so Ipswich is requesting to come on board as a member of the consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially what this means is that they would get um, a different rate for their tuition than a non-member. Um, they do have a substantially large population of students currently that attend North Shore Consortium and so they um, it made sense for them to do it from from their community perspective uh, they also being um, they are they are geographically in the same area as most of the other boards board schools uh, that are part of the consortium now so the the board um, voted unanimously to accept Ipswich and so now each school district, uh, each school committee has to uh, vote on this as well. And then I believe if they're, if they get a two, I think it's two thirds, then um, they would be accepted as a, uh, a full member. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Yep. Move to approve the addition of Ipswich as a member district to the North Shore Education Consortium. Second. Any questions? I actually yes. just I saw no downside to to voting in um, Ipswich because um, having other communities participate brings the prices down and adds the um, expertise to their board. Right. I did have a technical question that has no bearing on our vote. Um, it was talking about the governance and leadership, and that all the superintendents that are members of the board of directors have a specialty. A focus. I just was wondering which category you're in: finance, facilities, oh, policy. Oh, I'm in personnel. I'm sorry. I'm for, I, I had to think for a second. Yeah, I'm sorry. On, I'm, I'm I just the was chair, wondering. I'm the chair of the personnel subcommittee. Was curious to me that they wouldn't have already been a member. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. They, I believe they belong to the Crest Collaborative right now. And they can stay with that. Yeah. yeah. Just like we belong to two. Two, right. Um, you can belong to more than one. Mm -hmm. Yes. So being part of that personnel process, actually chair of it, does that um, expose you to sources of other trained personnel or that you can also bring back? My primary role, um, I'm involved with con contract negotiations when their collective bargaining agreements are up. Um, I work very closely with the executive director when there's a personnel, a major personnel issue. Um, work very closely with their labor council, those types of things. Good experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready for the vote. All those in favor? 5 0. And we. We're into reports yet, and then the yeah. liaison. Let's do the liaison. We'll end with reports. So, uh, does anyone have an interest to be a liaison to the uh, Human Relations Advisory Committee? Do you want to wait for Sherry to join? No. Sorry. She wouldn't she mind be interested. No. I, yeah, I mean, why, do don't we, why don't we uh, put this on the next you agenda? Can postpone, yeah, sure. postpone okay. that. Okay. I mean, I, I, especially I was I was sort of kidding, but she may be very interested. Yeah. It would be nice to be able to just have the dialogue. We'll leave that until the next one. Um, so now we have reports. And those students. 
Don't want to use that. Just as well. Uh, no, other than I know what we, Linda and I did attend the last, um, the last Tuesday's Board of Selectmen meeting on the public safety and, um, public safety fire and Rakasa. And so just to note that the Selectmen meet tomorrow night, I believe that's at the library again, right? Correct. So they're at the conference room in the Reading Public Library and these are the budget discussions that are important to everyone in our community and so it would be great to see more parents and, and community members there. Are these just uh, value discussions or are they actually showing numbers? And, and their value, it was a value really. Because I watched a lot of it and it wasn't, a, it was more of a, yeah. I think right now it is, I believe, uh, the last night is when the town manager will be presenting probably more financial, okay. which is Thursday. Or Wednesday night, I'm sorry, Wednesday night. This week? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Okay, sorry. Great. When did she? Um, I was just told that there's a CPAC meeting on Thursday, January 4th at 7. Location here. to be determined. Oh, thank you. There'll be an email coming out. That's my, oh, and Red just had a discussion about Reading Embraces Diversity. Um, had a meeting with the library um, talking about working on a World Cafe program for the community. So stay tuned. And then I there's um, another Reading Embraces Diversity meeting at the beginning of January. So I'm not going to say the date now because I'm worried I might get it wrong because it's not solid yet but stay tuned thank you okay no I did that. dr Daugherty. um thank you so tomorrow night um the uh facilities uh joe huggins is going to be doing a presentation on the uh capital plan um and the town core facilities budget he'll be doing um his presentation for the schools at the January 8th meeting. Um, Mrs. Dodd and I will be going tomorrow night uh, really to be there to um, answer any questions about any of the school related items that are on the capital plan. We are going to be talking um, a little bit about Killam. Um, very similar to what I read to you a couple of weeks ago uh, in my report on Killam, the MSBA report, and um, where you know where Killam lie on that report and the priorities that MSBA uses for funding uh, priorities putting one school ahead of another uh, the, the categories so all the things I discussed a couple of weeks ago is very similar to what I'm going to be talking about uh, tomorrow night mm -hmm. the the only piece that may be a little bit new is before we would be able to move it anywhere with Killam um, and where you know, in terms of a bigger plan is that you really need more information on what are the actual needs of the, the, the building itself, the Killam School. So one of the things that the town manager, myself, Mrs. Dowd, Joe Hoggins have talked about is getting a study done of Killam um, that will provide more information so that both the building committee, um, the school building, the, the school building, the town building committee, um, and the school committee um, can have more information moving forward. So I think what we will see is in the capital plan in the upcoming years, there will be some money put aside to do a feasibility study to take a look at what are the true needs of, of Killam. We do know some of them, as I've mentioned before. Um, certainly the, the water issue, which has been mitigated at this point. Um, also, we have some uh, windows replacement issues. Uh, some you know boiler heating issues those types of things fire suppression system those those ADA. In, in, the in, in the ADA right um, those are those are the ones that stick out right now but I think it would be important to get more details from a feasibility study so that um, can get all of the information possible before a decision is made on what can be done next but that's not in this budget no no, there. no. So really, that's all we're going to be saying about Killam. There is no plan in the near future for uh, a building project for Killam. Um, that would be obviously part of a larger discussion. And as I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, um, the MSBA has some pretty strict categories by statute 
on how you could get placed on a list to receive MSBA funding. And right now, Killam doesn't qualify for any of those areas um, because it's a fairly structurally sound building. Um, it's in very good shape. We've, you know, we've maintained it well over the years, and it does have some some issues, as we've mentioned earlier, but um, not to the level of MSBA. Yes. I, I just think that the way it was stated on the selectmen's agenda was a little misleading or confusing to people. So it's really the dialogue is about the Killam School. There is no building project no. in place, and the agenda item says Killam Building Project, and I think that was very it was confusing for people. Uh, so this is it's good to um, talk about it and um, that the building committee is in place now. You know which which it will be in place for this some future feasibility study so that's good to assist the school committee with the and the, type of and the town building committee has been doing its own um, assessment of each building they've got I know they've gone to kill them I was uh, there the night that they were doing their assessment there and they are going to each of the schools to do their own mm -hmm. assessment that's good. as well great yes um, I just wanted to say I met with the Boy Scouts last week and they were they had wonderful questions Weeblos they had wonderful questions and I know that this kill em question is on their minds and other people's minds one of the things that they brought up was this water situation that you said was mitigated and the conversation was about the water bubblers and so I just wanted to reiterate what you were saying is that the water now through the bub through the coolers is safe that the the school department went above and beyond to test to make sure that we discovered the issue and that the water coolers that are there provide the water and people are not drinking from the water bubblers anymore they, they can't they've been shut off yeah, the, they've been capped for right. a year now. so that yeah that's, that's that's been the case for over a year and the, the water yes. that they're drinking is bottled water right and so what I was saying is the mitigation the the solution is that those coolers can stay in an ongoing way so there isn't an issue around the safety of the water Correct. at the school I just wanted to reiterate that since it was a concern expressed by the Weeblos yes I, I just have a it's more of a thought to share with you as you approach the idea of a feasibility study. If possible, to look beyond the needs of the Killam School, but district-wide at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. We have three schools with um, modulars that won't last forever. So if it were possible to approach that project, not only looking at what does this one building need, but also, especially if we're talking a longer time sure. horizon, to also think through what's, what are the needs across the district, and might this project be able to solve those needs? Maybe, maybe not, but I'd like that question to at least be asked. Sure. Thanks. That's a very good point. Thank you. <coughs> Is that, that it for you? That's it, yes. Um, we're ready to adjourn, I think, correct? Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right, a motion to adjourn till January 8th, correct? Yep. Um, That's it. All those in favor? 5 0. Excellent. Thank you.